Good afternoon. I'm Anthony Page, Dean of FIU Law. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this third panel in response to the murder of George Floyd and the resulting civil unrest. I'd also like to thank our Student Bar Association and the H.T. Smith Black Law Students Association for their co-sponsorship. And I'm going to say thanks in advance to our four FIU Law graduate panelists. Uh, our moderator today is Willard Shepard. And you probably all know this already, but Willard Shepard, five-time Emmy award-winning journalist, Gulf War fighter pilot. He has been on NBC, NBC6 as an anchor and investigative reporter for more than 20 years. And of course, he is also an attorney and an FIU law graduate. At this point, I'm gonna turn this over to Willard Shepard. Thank you. All right, Dean, good day to you and to uh, all of our alums out there and everyone uh, who will uh, be on this platform today and beyond. Uh, thank you for your leadership through uh, these times that we are going through now and uh, getting ready our next uh, set of uh, attorneys that we are preparing to uh, get ready to uh, step out into uh, this area of, of so many things that are going on now that are, that are so important, things that uh, many of us have addressed for a significant time period and long time period, but are coming to the forefront uh, again for the first time uh, for many. But it's great to see that we had this participation uh, across the board today uh, from um, our state attorney's office, from uh, Carlos Martinez's office and the public defender, uh, private practice, uh, also uh, then uh, from our police union uh, being on board. And I think that's a testament, uh, Dean, to your leadership to be able to uh, gather this diversified group as we see how as uh, FIU alums, we're able to impact our community. And uh, we certainly uh, plan to do so in a uh, forceful and in a positive way. So uh, with that, I want to uh, bring in uh, all of the uh, other panelists uh, today who can uh, introduce themselves and uh, move forward. Uh, Reginald, uh, we'll start out uh, with you as well over at the State Attorney's Office. Good afternoon. First, I wanna say thank you to Professor Tote, Dean Anthony Page, the SBA, the H.T. Smith Balsa chapter for inviting us here today to be a part of this important conversation about the crisis that is happening in our country. So my name is Reginald Guillaume. I'm currently working as an assistant state attorney with the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office. I started working in the office in 2017. In my time at the office, I've worked as a line prosecutor in county court. I was then uh, promoted as a training attorney where my role in that capacity included training prosecutors, uh, teaching them how to conduct calendar calls, preparing cases for trial, and how to engage in plea negotiations. I was then, I then became an assistant chief in county court where I oversaw DUI cases, traffic related offenses, and direct files. Um, I supervised several courtrooms and helped lead uh, the training uh, for a class of um, 50 or more prosecutors, and I now serve as a felony prosecutor in circuit court where I prosecute felony and misdemeanor charges. Prior to working with the state attorney's office, I graduated from FIU uh, in 2017, uh, where I served as the former SBA president. I was also the bro director for H.C. Smith and also a member of the new court. Okay, great. Well, welcome aboard. Uh, Lewis, you're up next. Well, good afternoon, everybody, panelists and uh, everybody at FIU. Um, thank you for having this um, conversation. I think it's extremely important. My name is Louis Fuste, and um, I graduated from FIU Law School way back, way back in 2006. I started as part of the inaugural class in 2002. Um, prior to that, and continuing through my education at FIU, um, I was with the Miami-Dade Police Department. I became a police officer in 1983. Uh, prior to that, I was a PSA in the state of Miami in 82. And prior to that, I was in the Marine Corps. Um, and through my career in the police department as an officer, then as a sergeant, and then as a, um, as a lieutenant, I worked in uh, various assignments. After my graduation from FIU Law School, I was assigned to the legal bureau within the police department where I 
advised supervisors and, and road personnel on legal parameters with respect to their, their work performance and work functions on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, about 2011, I was assigned to the union. Uh, pursuant to our contract, you can be assigned to the union to carry out the, uh, the functions of the union. I, I went kicking and screaming, to be quite frank. I wasn't a big union, quote unquote, kind of guy. Um, but I was told that it's an entirely different world out there. And I, it opened my eyes to a lot of things that, are, that occur from the officer's level. Um, so I was there from 2011 to 2018, uh, representing uh, police officers in administrative matters, as well as quasi-criminal matters if they're being looked at by the state attorney's office. In 2018, I left. I opened up my own practice, but I still represent the officers uh, within the South Florida uh, Police Benevolent Association, as well as other clients. And again, I'm honored to be here and be part of this discussion. Lewis, thank you so much. Uh, because of your background, you have a tremendous uh, insight to this. Um, Stedman and uh, David and I are uh, buddies, and we stay in touch with each other frequently. And uh, in my line of work, try to make sure that uh, their views are always adequately uh, represented. And uh, my son's in the Marines. So, uh, Semper you know, Fi. Yeah, Semper Fi. We have a running battle in the house for you Marine tough guys. And, you know, I'm an A-10 pilot. So I always say, you know, you guys talk tough. But when it goes down, you call us. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna argue. I'm not going to argue with you there. <laughs> there you go. All right, Lewis, look forward to it. And you and I have to stay in touch with each other beyond this. Uh, Ms. Johnson, and, uh, Public Defender's Office, Carlos Martinez has done a tremendous amount of outreach and to do his very best to uh, represent these indigent clients. Uh, and uh, he and I have these conversations frequently about moving forward. And uh, I know that uh, you all are very dedicated to what you are doing there to make sure that everyone gets representation uh, across the board. So please tell us more about yourself and uh, your thoughts about where we are today and moving forward. Hello, my name's Chris Savia Johnson. I would like to first thank you all for allowing me to be here um, to BOSA and FIU and Dean Page. Also, thank you to Professor Cote. Um, I graduated from FIU Law in 2017 with Mr. Guillaume, and I began my career as an assistant public defender in Broward County. I've been there since 2017, excuse me, 2018, early 2018. I began as a misdemeanor as public defender, then I graduated to a felony attorney where I was a, a, a line third, a line third, and then I became a second. Now I am currently a um, assistant public defender in what in Broward County we call crossover. So our juvenile, there are juveniles that have dependency case, cases attached in the system. So I'm sorry. So basically, it's kind of hard to explain, but the juveniles are in the dependency system and they also have delinquency cases pending. So we try to keep them in one courtroom so they have all their services, whatever they may require, and they're before the same judge. So their dependency judge is the same as their delinquency judge. Okay, Ms. Johnson, I'm remiss uh, there that I uh, did not mention uh, Mr. Gordon Weeks and the other people that are there in your office uh, moving forward uh, in a good direction in Broward County. And uh, thank you for your service to our community there. Um, Kayla Smith, on a private practice uh, will come in and uh, give us a concept and idea of uh, where uh, uh, they are with their firm and where we are today. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Keila Smith. I uh, first want to thank everybody that put this on, but not only that, thank the, participant, the participants for logging in and listening to this conversation. I graduated from FIU in 2014. When I graduated, I became a public defender in Miami um, for five years. So when I went there, I first um, defended those who were charged with misdemeanors. I went on to felonies um, to defend those who were, char were charged with first degree felonies, um, punishable by life felonies and things of that such. Um, after doing that for four years, I became a training attorney where I went back down to county court to teach young attorneys, those who are graduating, a lot like those 3Ls right now who are going to graduate and become public defenders. Um, I was training those individuals on the Constitution on how to hold the state to, uh, to the fire, really, and make sure that people's rights are, are not being violated. Um, that's what I love to do. Uh, I did that for five years. At this point, I'm at Fishery David, 
which is a law firm in, uh, in Hollywood, Florida. There I, uh, I try civil cases, but primarily what I focus on there is criminal defense. And I do civil work, um, but I focus on criminal defense and the civil rights litigation there. So that's where my passion is, that's where my heart is. And um, so that's my background. <laughs> Awesome. Kayla, do us a favor because yes. you have an incredible smile. Move over to a little bit to the right. Move over to the right. There we go. Now we can completely and fully see you there. Okay. So, okay, perfect. Uh, I want to turn it back over to uh, the dean for his, uh, you know, comments uh, in terms of where we are, where the law school is addressing uh, these matters. So, uh, Dean Page. Uh, thank you, Willard. So, the law school is in is doing a variety of things in response to this particular situation. Um, we've always been committed to racial justice, but it's become really clear over the events of the last month, and frankly, it should have been clearer before, that we really haven't been doing enough. Now, there are a couple of initiatives that we have planned. Obviously, these panels are simply a, a uh, a first response, if you like, but there's a variety of different things that we have planned. Uh, one that you should watch for a, re a release, a press release later this week, but we're working with the other, I believe it will be the other 12 law schools on a consortium that will specifically focus on racial justice. And there will be opportunities for students. We plan to work with community partners and what I really like about this initiative, it's all 12 of the Florida law schools standing up and acknowledging that as the, uh, as the schools where we are developing future lawyers, we have a special obligation in these times. So watch for an announcement later this week. In addition, we're working with other law schools right across the country on a virtual clinic that will focus in particular on police brutality. Now, um, this is taking a little longer to get off the ground because they're, we're looking at about 30 law schools right across the country that will be involved in this, and we're working on governance structure and funding, but that's something that I think will be ready for announcement at some point in about the next month or so. We're also looking at things internally, in particular, what we do, we, we, are, we, are, uh, we are a majority minority school, we're majority first generation, but there are always more things we can do to make sure that all of the members of our community feel included, feel welcomed, feel valued. And so we at the law school are looking also not just at what can be done externally, but also looking inside our own house at how we can improve. So those are some of the things. We're certainly trying to act both quickly, but also intentionally and deliberately. As I do think as, as South Florida's public law school, we have a particular and specific obligation given, uh, all, of, all, of the, given all of the problems right across the country. Okay, uh, let's go uh, to uh, Reginald there in your office. Tell me uh, about the uh, uh, kind of across the board, the message uh, that the state attorney has sent uh, to you all and uh, your mission there in terms of uh, making sure that, you, you know, justice is fair in terms of, of the prosecutions and, and, and things that you are doing there uh, across the board, not just now, but even in, in the past before all of this came to the forefront again about making sure uh, that everyone is treated fairly. Thank you for your question. And so um, when I started my career in the state attorney's office, I had an opportunity to meet, um, you know, Ms. Fernandez Rendell and uh, Mr. Don Horn, who is a pillar in the community in terms of um, being a prosecutor um, in Miami-Dade County and um, his, the work that he's done. And so one of the things that they really instilled in us when we first started working there is that we are ministers of justice. And what is a minister of justice? And so a minister of justice, as a prosecutor, we have to make sure that when we are prosecuting our cases, that we look at our cases, we look to see whether or not 
we could bring a charge against an accused individual, we have to make sure that their rights are known to them at the time that they're being prosecuted, and also that we have to take into consideration, one, whatever information that we have from uh, their defense attorney, whether it be a public defender or a private defense attorney, whatever information that they have to present to us, we have to assess that information to make sure that we are seeing things from both ends, from the state's side in terms of the crimes we're prosecuting, but also in mitigating factors that the um, defense attorney is presenting in terms of the case, showing us whether or not we have weaknesses in our case. Is this a case that the state can indeed um, prosecute? Uh, like Ms. Smith has said, I've been in court with Ms. Smith and we've had a couple of cases together. She does hold my feet to the fire in terms of the cases that I prosecute. And so sh there is a standard um, that, you know, within our office that we prosecute cases that we believe that we could bring um, and we have to do our job to prosecute it. And if we see any um, things that if the case can't go forward, then we are not going to go and prosecute a case where we know there is information that shows that this person did not, did not commit a crime, that the law doesn't support us to go forward on a case where we don't have the, 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 the probable cause, we don't have the, the, the evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's been my experience since I started with the state attorney's office. And so um, at least in my role, because um, I've had different roles as a line prosecutor, as a, a supervisor, you know, I, I take it upon myself to when I have individuals that come to me and they have cases where they have questions and they're asking me, how do we go forward with a case? I make sure to the best of my abilities that I educate them. Um, I ask them the hard questions in terms of what are we doing here? Do we have sufficient evidence to go forward on our cases? Um, what are the mitigating factors that a def uh, defense attorney is presenting in terms of their client? Is this the type of cases where we're seeking um, a jail? Is this a case where somebody deserve a diversion program? Because it's really important to make sure that we're looking at these cases one by one and making sure that each defendant get, gets the justice that they deserve. All right, Reginald, let me follow up with one thing for you. Uh, a lot of times, and you know, in my world, I deal with a lot of people from uh, the community of different backgrounds who feel that, um, that the investigations take such a lengthy time period, uh, many times, especially when it involves uh, police officers, and obviously they deserve their due process. So how do we balance due process with what the community at times feels is um, something that may be plain for them to see, especially because we have these body cameras and everybody has a camera now. Uh, how do we balance that? And just talk to us about that. Sure. Um, it's, a, it's a fine balance, right? So the law allows us uh, in terms of um, when we have cases that are filed, at least at the felony level, we have um, first um, within 21 days where we get to assess um, whatever evidence that we have in a case to file a case. If not, you know, the state is entitled to a reset to the 30th day for us to file the charges. You know, with every cases that we receive, um, you know, there has to be a thorough investigation of that case, especially now. Um, now, within the last three years, we've transitioned into the age of technology where we now have body and camera that's available to our use, but there still needs to be investigation where we have civilian witnesses that come in uh, to our offices, where we interview them. We have to uh, speak to our police officers. We have to talk to um, for example, if there were CSI um, experts that came out and investigated a scene, there is quite an amount of investigation that needs to be done. And we want to make sure that we're filing cases where we can actually go forward on the case. And, you know, it's, it's, it's important for us to know, to assess the quality um, of the evidence that we have. Uh, it's important for us to, to make sure that we're able to move forward with uh, the case. And generally, okay. why it, it takes a long time, and especially when we see, uh, 
you know, uh, things that a, a regular civilian would, would, would feel like it, it's a clear and cut case. However, there's still the law that we must follow. And so the law really streamlines how we could go forward with a case. Okay. Uh, Lewis, uh, I want to bring you into this conversation. And we've heard a lot about this term uh, called defunding the police. Um, I've tried my best on uh, NBC to try to say that uh, from my education about this, and um, for those of you who don't know, the president of the Miami-Dade PBA, uh, Mr. Stahl, Stedman Stahl, uh, he and I had this conversation the other day. Uh, this term, defund the police, what I believe 95% of people that are calling for that are actually talking about changing resources, making sure you have more job counselors, uh, psychological counselors, social workers to uh, aid police officers so that the police don't actually have to do that and they can do their real job. You've lived in all these worlds. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about that and uh, transitioning funds? I think defunding the police is a bad uh, way to try to describe that. Well, thank you, Lynn. Um, thank you for the question. I, I agree with you. Listen, my family business um, was into marketing. So marketing and, or positioning is key to a movement or to anything you want to get across to the public. And I think the term defunding the police um, it, it sets a bad tone. You know, the, the actual verbiage itself um, kind of invokes people saying, well, you want to undo the police department. Look, I, I agree. If your definition of defunding the police is providing better resources for all the ancillary and, and supplemental support units that you're talking about, there isn't a police department and or police chief that will disagree with you. Uh, I will tell you this, that officers, um, when they're called to scenes with respect to either mental issues or social issues, by the time we get there, there's something already broken or that, that requires to be fixed and not from a police level. I mean, at the end of the day, our job is to, to be guardians. We protect the public. Um, at times we have to switch that hat and become what's known as warriors. And that's a big debate in, in the culture we're talking about now. Are we guardians or are we warriors? Obviously, I'm, I'm of the belief, and so is the PBA, that we're really all guardians. We protect the people. Um, to get officers involved in um, issues that, that have their roots either in mental illness, which that can be an entire panel on how the American Medical Association started treating their um, patients as outpatients, putting the responsibility on the criminal justice system, putting the responsibility on correctional officers, and putting the responsibility on, on the family members is, 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 is problematic. And that happened back in the late 70s. And I got that information from one of the current judges uh, who was handling that project here in Miami. It was shocking to me how something that happened 20, 30 years ago can still have echoing effects on, on the public. Now, with respect to, um, let me give an example, which has been cited often in the media about Camden, New Jersey. Now, my understanding there is they, um, the state, the police department was funded by the state. They, the, they were having tremendous budget issues back in 2011 to the point where they let go of a hundred and something police officers, thus, thus not allowing to serve the community. Crime went through the roof. Issues were not being resolved. And the people who stayed on were disheartened and not addressing the issues of the community. They eliminated the police department, started a new local police department, conducted new interviews, and hired 85% of the force back to the department, the same officers. They increased the budget, better training, and they took more of a guardian approach, better community outreach, better efforts to reach out to the public to have a partnership. I'm a little biased, clearly. Miami-Dade Police Department, I think our department is head and shoulders above the rest. I would even say above the nation. We went through our growing pains in the 80s. I was here in the department in 83 when there was a great deal of civil unrest. Uh, our department today mirrors the, the, the community of polices. Is there room for improvement? Definitely. But I think if you take money away from the police department to fund something else, all you're doing is playing with line items and the problem will serve for standing crimes. I actually think you need more resources and more funding um, to both the police department as well as social services to aid the department in their, in their job to protect and serve. Okay. Do you think these funds, and I'm talking about uh, social workers, mental counselors, drug counseling, these types of things, should that be under the police department in your view or outside of the police department um, in, a, in a different fashion? What, what are your thoughts about that? Because I've had so many officers say to me, hey, look, 
no matter what happens now, somebody calls 911 and we're the ones that go there. I'm not a drug counselor. I'm not a psychiatrist. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I was talking about. The fact that by the time we get there, listen, I used to work gangs and it broke my heart when I'd get to the gang members' families, um, the residents, and whether they were white, Hispanic, black, I always found an underlying, obviously I'm not a psychologist, so mine would be more of a street uh, uh, analysis, but I always found there'd be something broken in the home that perhaps a counselor could help. Maybe some more activities for the, for the, uh, for the kids so they're not on the street. Sometimes it was parents that were just absent. Other times it's parents that's just trying to make um, ends meet and working double jobs. At the end of the day, the child um, was being neglected in some form and maybe followed influences that he shouldn't be or she shouldn't be following. Uh, that broke my heart. So um, to me, I think a department like that should be run outside the police department with some type of communication, maybe a, a, a joint board to speak. I don't want to get it too bureaucratic because being on the department for 32 years, I realized some things are extremely layered and bureaucratic. And although the intention is well placed, um, the small um, or the individuals that really require the help get lost in the shuffle. And that would be sad because the bigger the bureaucracy is, the worse it is for the public. Okay. Uh, Ms. Johnson, I'm sure that you would like to have more resources. What are your thoughts on this about uh, being able to do some preventive measures so you don't end up with these clients? So um, as a public defender, I've noticed that our clients come from different backgrounds, have faced different issues. And I know in Broward, we have a few courts that handle some of the issues, whether it's um, mental health or a drug court, but I feel like something should happen before um, they get to that, get to the court system. Like me being a juvenile, it, you can see like a lot of kids are for things that when I was younger, you may have got suspended for or went to internal suspension, kids are being shuffled into the system. So there needs to be more in place where funding for like diversionary programs for the kids. I'm not in Miami, so I'm not familiar with the amount of diversion programs that Miami has. I'm more familiar with Broward, but I know like there's not as many programs. So there needs to be funding for those things to try to help at that level. I know we also have issues with um, low level crimes being charged. So we get cases at, when I was in felony court where they have 0 0.05 grams of cocaine and this person is facing prison um, and we have to deal with that. So like things like that, knowing when to, like Mr. Guillaume was saying, when to file a case, how to look at the, the circumstances of everything. Um, I understand the defund the police situation is allocating the funds. Yes, police officers aren't, um, aren't social workers, aren't drug counselors, but they should be working with people that are those so they understand how to de-escalate situations when something occurs. How do you handle a mental health patient? You don't go to them guns blazing. You you have to sometimes talk down, talk that person down, get the right people involved. That's where those resources need to come in, where you need how to handle those situations when you have that when you have certain a certain population of people that need the help. So that's where, um, that's my stance on that because we, it's, it's tough trying to nav navigate the criminal justice system with some, by putting someone in jail. Like that doesn't solve the issue. It, it's, that person still has the issue. Sending someone to prison doesn't solve the issue. It's, they need the fund, we need the funding in order to get the services the, pers the people need. Okay, uh, Ms. Smith, you can bring somewhat of a, a, a private perspective to this. What are your thoughts? Yes, well, I can actually bring both perspectives as a former public defender and as a, a private attorney working doing criminal defense and civil rights. You know, I think part of the problem, we talk about training, we talk about all of these things. And when, when we're talking about, when they are talking about, I guess, defund the police, some are saying to uh, take those resources and put them other places, but some are really saying dismantle the police. There are a lot of, uh, of bad apples, as people like to say, inside the police department, but it's not just the police. It is the state attorney's offices. It's the judges. It's everyone. This is not just, oh, let's do some training. Let's give police officers more money and more resources. This is about 
let's see what the bad apples are in there, right? Let's look at, let's dismantle the police department. Let's get them psychological evaluations. Let's see if the ones who are out on the streets um, protecting us, they know the law and that they are psychologically uh, well. You know, it, it doesn't make sense in our, our system where we hold police officers who have the most power, we hold them the least accountable. We have citizens out on the streets where, you know, if you do anything, you are arrested immediately. And now the state attorney's office have to make this decision as to whether to bring those charges or whether to, uh, to put you in prison. Where when an officer does something, there's all of these questions. Now the state attorney's office has to do an investigation to see if a crime was really committed. So I think the problem is within the laws themselves. Why is there qualified immunity? Why is it that these people with badges and guns and a license to kill are held uh, less accountable. We live in a country where I have to deal with this as a defense attorney. You know, we live in a country where we talk about deterrence. We're not a rehabilitation country. We are a country that focuses on deterrence. So why is it that when a citizen is arrested, the state attorney's office asks for jail so that this person can not commit crimes in the future, whereas a police officer who does something wrong commits a crime now it's about rehabilitation. Now it's about, well, let's get them training. So I think at, at, a, at the ground root, we are talking about issues in this society where all of us should galvanize and say what we're trying to work within a system as it exists now. We should think about in a system, how would this system work for the black and brown community? It's not working as it is now. So what can we do to fix it? And I think holding police officers accountable for uh, because they should be, and they should actually be held more accountable because they are the ones with the license to kill. We're talking about talking to the state attorney's offices. Why is it that there are different plea offers, uh, offers for one individual, where is another for a white individual? Where is the, uh, the, the fairness in any of this? So we're, why not talk to the state attorney's offices and get them on board because Although Reginald brings up a lot of points, it's not all this, it, it doesn't work that way. You know, Reginald can train, he can, he can talk to his supervisors. By the end of the day, it's KFR at the top. And whoever's at the top and makes the rules, that's how it's gonna work. So that's talking to them. Talk to the judges about their biases, not just implicit biases, not always implicit, but let's talk about why is it that sentencing might be different from this black individual whereas you believe that a white individual can be rehabilitated. So there are issues that are not being dealt with that we can do more um, if we just come together on the same page and, and attack every stage of the criminal injustice system. Well, Lewis, to uh, Miss Smith's point, and I'm getting um, people who are, uh, are, are participating with us asking questions, and to follow up on a point that she made, Lewis, uh, what, what is your viewpoint about initially taking officers in? Uh, the question here I have is, is basically you need a high school diploma or a GED and that uh, do those requirements need to be changed just on a fundamental basis as to who the police department will accept in the first place? Well, I can answer that question. I mean, I'm not in, I'm not in human resources. I know that the Miami Police Department changed their hiring standards and there was a time there, I don't know if it's still in place now, they were requiring a two year degree in college. Um, um, to her point about psychological evaluations, every single Miami-Dade police officer before they get hired um, has to go through a psychological and extensive background. It takes about nine months. And to be quite frank, we're having a very difficult time hiring individuals that meet the criteria. Same with corrections. Our corrections department, I speak to the director in corrections all the time, and he tells me it's just difficult to find the people that qualify. Your record has to be clean. You can't have any um, issues with your credit history. Obviously, certain arrests are permissible. Other felonies are not. Plus, you have to uh, pass a psychological. And that psychological is an extensive psychological. Um, now, as to the point about officers are, are held to a different standard, I, I personally feel my experience has been in dealing with the state attorney's office and dealing with internal affairs investigators as well as the federal government. We are held to different standards. I've had police officers that get arrested and can't do a plea on certain cases because the state attorney's office says, no, we're not gonna do a plea with you, whether it's a DUI. I had a case recently that made the media where an, an individual um, appeared to uh, abuse his daughter on camera. 
And the judge told the state attorney, anybody else would be a pretrial, would be some anger management course. And the prosecutor said, absolutely not. This is a police officer, not something they did on duty. That's another thing. Officers are held to a standard on or off duty. The example I always give is if I walk into Home Depot right now and get into an argument with an individual, and that individual calls my department and says, I don't like the way this guy treated me. Who is he? Well, he's a lieutenant for the police department. Yeah, but was he working? No, he wasn't working. They still have to do an investigation on my behavior off duty. There's no other civilian that I know that is checked on their behavior when they're off duty. Now, that is the Miami-Dade Police Department. I can't speak for the state of Miami or any other department in the United States. I do know that on average in this country, there's a thousand arrests of police officers a year, an average of three a day. That statistic is easily verified. And there's over 800,000 police officers in this country, 10 million arrests. Of the 10 million arrests, 586,000 are violent felons. If you do the math, that's one violent felony arrest a minute. So while we've been on this, this uh, panel here, it's been approximately 43 minutes. There's been 43 violent felony arrests in this country. Is there room for improvement? Definitely. Do I believe that there should be social programs to avoid people from getting into the system? 100%. Do I believe in pretrial diversion? I personally do. I've seen it work. I think that unfortunately, by the time we get there, the police officer gets there, a lot of the issues have not been dealt with. And law enforcement, yes, it's there to protect and serve, but we're not therapists, we're not psychologists. We do receive training on mental, um, mental issues, critical incident management and training in the department. But even the individual who puts that classes together will tell you if individuals are in crises and there is de-escalation procedures in place in the county, there comes a point in time where that individual may, for unknown reasons, want to hurt you and you still have to protect your life. Again, just, for, just to put it out there, I don't agree with the, the images we see with, um, with um, Mr. George Floyd. Clearly, as an attorney, I can tell you, I don't know what happened there because a, a video image is just a two-dimensional image. There are many things going on there but I can't see a justification for that with respect to what I see on the image. And I've been a police officer for 32 years and I've been in those situations. I've been involved in shootings. It's not a pleasant feeling. Um, you feel like your life is over right then and there. Something with that, I think the public doesn't fully understand that in those split second decisions, unless there's enough training and not just training, but conditioning, anybody who's been in the military will understand that you're gonna revert back to your natural human instinct of fight or flight. And the only thing, that will mitigate that is the training and conditioning, which is continued training. So it almost becomes muscle memory. Oh. Um, Dean, uh, if you can uh, step in here as to how the uh, university as a whole, and not just our law school, uh, can interject uh, the skill sets that we have to address these matters uh, across the board. Uh, sure, and thank you. In fact, I think I can address that fairly, fairly quickly. I'm going to encourage anybody who didn't, did it, didn't see our panel from last week. That panel focused specifically on community alliances and allegiances and allyship in general. And it really focused on what people can do. Um, that was, in fact, a panel topic that was motivated from our very first session where a lot of people in the community and a lot of students really felt um, almost powerless. And so I would recommend that people tune in to the, the recording is on our website at, uh, at, at FIU Law. And I think there are a, a lot of ideas there for what individuals can do. Uh, I think you also mentioned the university in general. Uh, of course, as the university, we're part of the state university system and um, there are various constraints, but the president has announced a, uh, the president of the university has announced a task force, which is gonna look at uh, specifically what is going on at the university and where we as a university can improve. Okay, um, I want to give uh, each of you a minute or so to uh, kind of wrap up your thoughts here. I'm getting some questions uh, specifically uh, from Professor Washburn about qualified immunity. So uh, whichever one of you wants to uh, tackle that, but Reginald, we'll start with you with your closing remarks. Yes, thank you. Um, I think we are um, 
and an incredible time in our nation for us to continue to address this issue. And so one of the things that, that, that I say often is that, you know, this is something that's been happening within our country. And now the voice, the voice of the people are finally being listened to. And so what I want to do and encourage a lot of our, um, you know, FIU law students in going into the workforce, um, if you choose to become a prosecutor, a public defender, a private attorney, uh, or you want to go into private practice, know that you have a voice and that your voice, you know, you became an advocate for reason and that you have to speak against racial injustices, injustices anywhere. And don't be, don't shy away from the fact that you are a new graduate when you come into your position. You know, you, if you were hired in a position, wherever it may be, it's because there is a reason they, they recognize your potential. They recognize that you have what it needs to, 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 to be an advocate. And so I encourage you, please speak up. I had an opportunity to share with my colleagues at the state attorney's office how I felt about um, the, the incident that, involved, uh, that, that happened with George Floyd. And that led into a greater conversation within the office where you know, a number of, of our colleagues had to attend um, and we're having a lot of follow-up conversations about that. And also it gave me an opportunity to speak with um, my direct supervisors that, that weren't aware of some of the stuff that was happening. And so in using my voice and voicing that, you know, the way that George Floyd was murdered truly affected me, affected my, the work that I was doing um, because I wanted to be a prosecutor because I wanted to effectuate change in the criminal justice system. And I wanted to, I want to continue to, to, to prosecute crimes and I want to make sure that we are doing the right things and that we're not letting people that commit crimes just go away. And so if we're holding black people accountable, white people should be held accountable. Hispanic people should be held accountable. Men should be held accountable. Women should be held accountable. And it shouldn't be a tipping scale of the justice system. And so I encourage you, speak up. Your voice is needed. You chose this profession for this very reason. We believe in you. Thank you. Uh, Lewis, uh, what would you uh, want to leave with us? Well, I, I want to leave with us. Obviously, I, I agree with um, what Reggie's talking about. At the end of the day, I think equal justice for all um, is, is extremely what the system, the way it should work. But at the end of the day, look, in, in my opinion, and again, this is me speaking personally, there is no police department. There is no criminal justice system. At the end of the day, it's all made up of people. People make up, you know, I mean, to, to quote a legal um, doctrine, it's, uh, you know, the, the people are the agent of the entities they represent collectively. So when I, when I hear the department this, or police officers this, or state attorney's offices, yeah, they, it's individuals. And the only way individuals, in my opinion, can come together and reach some type of agreement is by opening up dialogue, communicating, exchanging. I'm gonna view things, obviously, from my perspective. I have my point of view, my experiences. It doesn't mean I'm close-minded to something else. But the only way to do this is to sit down and talk. And with respect to um, changes, obviously, my department is completely different in its makeup, and its behavior and how it functions, police functions, than when I started in 83. I'm a firm believer that the only thing that never changes is the fact that everything changes. Um, and, and I know that being part of the union draws a lot of negative attention, that we protect police officers. The only thing we do at the union is, again, quoting what Ms. Smith says, holding the state to the fire. I agree with that as a police officer, and I agree with that as a union attorney. If you're gonna bring a case to a police officer or an individual, and you do not have your information right, you should not be doing it. To me, that is the, the, the greatest injustice you can do. Great, put your case together. I've had police officers keep their jobs, not because they didn't do anything wrong, it's because the department rushed to get an investigation done. Political pressure, pressure from the top, I don't know, didn't bother to look at, into it, and they get sloppy. They get sloppy. And the one thing that I learned in, in, in FIU Law is my, my criminal law professor, they told me, listen, I had a great um, run as a defense attorney in Washington, D.C. And I said, well, you just told me how bad the Washington, D.C. Police Department is because the defense attorney's job is to hold the state 
to the fire. I agree with that statement 100%, and it applies to police officers as well as all citizens. And with respect to qualified immunity, as we all know, that applies to civil um, uh, lawsuits. It doesn't apply to criminal. You can't avail yourself of qualified immunity and protect yourself when you violated a law. What it allows you to do is the courts to step into the mind of a police, department, a police officer in a given situation with an objective standard. Not subjective, not whether that police officer felt in fear, but whether a reasonable police officer in that officer's shoes, considering the training of that officer, would have done the same thing. It's a reasonableness standard. By getting rid of it, what the standard you're going to put to the police department is, they had to be correct. In other words, that motion by that individual, which looked like a gun and turned out to be, unfortunately, maybe some other object, you have to wait for that officer to ensure that it's a firearm. It's a very, very dangerous position to be in. I've been in that position. I've been shot at numerous times. It's not comfortable. And to be quite frank, it's something that I'm glad I left behind because it is taxing on the body and on the mind. I just think that having a dialogue is the only way to get this thing done and obviously putting words into action. Okay. Lewis, in terms of dialogue at my office at NBC, and when you get done, you can reach out to uh, David and Mr. Jenkins and uh, Stedman. Uh, we have a survey that uh, we would love to do uh, anonymously uh, with the uh, uh, members of the union about what their thoughts are about all of these things and some of the matters that you addressed. And uh, we're, we're waiting to hear back about that. And I'm sure you'll have uh, a, an opinion about that. So if you could discuss that with them, I would certainly appreciate it. Real quick, just real quick, William, understand something that the union doesn't set policy by the department. The union negotiates a contract with the county itself. The department itself is in charge of setting policy. I think JP um, Perez before, Freddie Ramirez did a great job. I think Freddie Ramirez is doing an excellent job with the police department. So again, the union represents the officers, but it's the department that pushes its policy and its procedures on how to handle policing. Yeah, no, this is really, and I'll talk to you offline about that, but it's, it's okay. not about policy. It's just about what they think about doing their job and how they feel uh, things and improvements that could be made. And we want their input uh, to make sure that their voices are heard. So, um, Ms. Johnson, please. Um, my closing thoughts are um, for the FIU community. Um, you're entering into a new profession. You know, you're aware of the laws and everything that's going on, um, whatever, for whatever route you choose to go, whether it's public service, whether it's private. Um, when we have this conversation about what's going on in the world with George, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, all of those people, we have to stop and think. A lot of people are going against the whole Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I feel like people have to check their privilege and where they stand as regards to, um, and have to understand where a person of color is coming from when they have encounters with the police. So our experience isn't the same across the board. Even here in Broward County, um, with even with the body cameras that are available, the whole issue with the older guy um, in the protest, I, I can't remember what state, police not telling the truth. So we have that issue even now in when we're going through cases, because our clients will tell us what happened, but the police report is written up one way, then you see the body camera and it shows something totally different and it, the accountability needs to be, like um, was mentioned before, the police need to be held to the fire. Um, the state attorneys do too. They need to do their job and check the body camera footage because there are so many things that don't have to go through the system if only we watch the body camera and not just rely specifically on a police report because the police report doesn't say everything. Um, we also have to think about our kids. Um, what are we exposing them to? I work in the juvenile system and our kids are constantly in the system for things that are petty. Why is my child, why is a kid that has a, a little tuffle with um, another child getting arrested? Why is he going to the detention center? Why can't that be handled internally? We, there's so many resources that need to be allocated to help our juveniles because they shouldn't be exposed to the system in the first place um, for especially minor things, things that need to be done outside. There needs to be funding to help our kids. And in the juvenile system, the majority of kids I see are black and brown kids. I don't see many Caucasian kids come through the system. So we need to um, 
check, we need the police officers to check their, their biases also because I can have a kid that gets arrested for marijuana and then another kid that smokes marijuana all the time is on Instagram that's Caucasian, he's not getting arrested. Or we have to look at those things. Why is the officer more inclined to um, approach someone of color rather than someone that's not of color? Why are our um, people of color being penalized more for crimes. Like I mentioned earlier, I had cases when I was in felony, there's 0 0.05 grams of cocaine. This is residue. Why, why are we charging fel third, this as a third degree felony? Why is it not a possession of paraphernalia? Why is it, why are we saying, okay, this person needs to go to jail because he was stopped on the bike and the police officer happened to find um, some cocaine residue somewhere in a little baggie or something. Like it's little petty crimes that need to be we need the state attorney's office needs to do something internally and the police officers, they need to look at those things too, because some people they decide to give civil citations to. I've had um, Caucasian um, clients that got civil citations before they ever were even in the juvenile system. And some of my kids, their first crime is a possession of marijuana, but they're getting arrested. Why? Why? What's the difference? The only difference is one is of color. So we have to, we have to check our privilege and see like, what what advantages do we have how what are your biases when you see a black or brown person is is your first instinct to be on guard i've had uh, i there's educated people that get pulled over by the police and th their first there's been encounters where their first instinct is um they pull a gun why are you pulling a gun for a traffic stop so all these things need to be need to be looked into like these police officers need to be held to the fire. Our office has tried to do that with like exposing body camera footage. There was a case in Broward a couple months ago where a guy was having a mental health issues. He was in the hospital. The officer punched him in the face. He's handcuffed to a bed. That's not okay. And that didn't come to light, but for a body cam that they thought they turned off, that they, they took the body camera off but they didn't think it was recording and they're punching a guy in the face while he's chained to a hospital bed. So that that's something else that needs to be looked into the officer's control of body cams because even as a as a defense attorney there's so much control of the over those body cams with sound they cut sound on off um the body cams on and off and we miss things so things could happen like one minute on the body cam our client looks fine the next minute they have bruises and they're being charged with resisting so there's gaps in things so those things need to be um, looked into, and I believe the state attorney's office as an arm of the police department have to look at their officers. What, what are their officers being investigated for? Why does it take 12 internal, internal affairs investigations before um, someone gets caught on body camera? Why isn't this person being checked before they, they have to kill someone? Or Things need to be checked ahead of time instead of like something coming to the media and they say, oh, he's had 12 excessive use or 20 excessive use, excessive use of force complaints. So um, that's my piece on everything that's going on. But we, we have to hold the police accountable. Yes, they are humans, but their job is to protect and serve. We shouldn't, our kids shouldn't be afraid when they see the police officer. An African-American shouldn't be afraid when they see a police officer. They should feel like that person's there to help them, not to think about whether or not they're gonna live or die at the end of the day. And that's where I say Okay, that. thank you. Ms. Smith. There was a 20 year old black man that police officers believed had trespassed at an establishment. They beat him unconscious, five officers, and dragged him across the street. And when a civilian who was a nurse said, I can help this young man, these five police officers said, no, we got it. And they threw his property on top of him. That's an untold story. George Floyd, that's just a story that's told. Ahmaud Aubrey, that's just a story that's told. This is a problem. This is a systematic problem. Systematic racism is not just a phrase. It is a, a way of living for many of us. So when you ask, what can we do? What can getting rid of qualified immunity do? Of course, you guys are talking to practitioners. The reason for this panel is so that you guys can get an inside look at not what the theory of everything is, but what we do on a daily basis and what we see. 
And so when we're talking about qualified immunity and it, it being civil, what we're talking about at the end of the day is holding people accountable. Where you talk about, you know, um, the, uh, an object of standard for something like qualified immunity, us practitioners know that when we walk in court, that officer is not going to be held accountable because that objective standard is very, very much looked at in the officer's uh, favor. So what I'm talking about is when you have officers coming in depositions, sworn depositions and lying, hold those officers accountable. When we have officers shooting men, black men, black women unarmed, hold those officers accountable. We're not talking about the felonies that some should not be felonies to begin with, but we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is systematic racism. So the media can help by publicizing a lot of these untold stories. The, the, the prosecutors can help by when, they're, when their superiors tell them to go after something they don't believe in, that they use, they have a backbone that they have discretion because the line prosecutors should have discretion. They are the ones who are living and breathing and talking to the defense attorneys. We're talking about police officers. I've been talking about police officers all day, but we're not talking about getting rid of everything. What we're talking about is readdressing a lot of these issues that are actually just Jim Crow laws. What we're talking about is talking to <laughs> judges and having them come back and say, look at these cases. Yes, prosecutor, I see this. Yes, defense attorney, I see this. But why is it last week you gave a white man a better offer? We're talking about every single layer being a part of this discussion. And th it just starts here. This is a wonderful, wonderful panel. I love talking on this panel. And we need more of this. We need more discussions because without discussions, there can be no action. So all I'm saying is, we need to talk to every layer in this criminal and justice system and civil, because although <laughs> we're talking about criminal, it bleeds into civil because no one cares until you hit their pockets. So I just ask that everyone, the FIU uh, future alums out there, the alumni, the teachers, the professors, everyone just Hold yourselves accountable. Think about what you can do on a daily basis. Think about a person or an organization that you can get involved in that can further our cause because right now we are still living and breathing under Jim Crow, Crow laws. And until that changes, there's not gonna be a lot of movement that we can do. So I thank you guys for having this discussion. I, I thank you for having this panel and I, I would obviously come back at any time. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, before I send it over to the Dean for his closing remarks, uh, I want to thank each of you again and all of those uh, who joined us uh, on the uh, Zoom panel. I think this is uh, something we uh, should continue going forward as you talk about the discussion. Uh, the great thing here is uh, all of us have our law school in common, but as we can see, uh, we all have different skill sets and uh, the way to uh, solve many of these problems is to bring people who have many different skill sets together to uh, address them in a unified fashion. And I think that's the uh, greatest thing that we can get out of uh, our conversation today. So uh, Dean, I'll send it over to you for uh, your closing thoughts. And again, thank you uh, for your brainchild of having this and not just this panel, but those that we've had before and moving forward. Thank you very much. And I, I must say, please don't think of my words as the last words or closing words. Please think of what our panelists and what uh, Willard said as truly the last words. Um, I'd like to echo that. Thank you very much to Christavia and Lewis and Keila and Reggie, and of course to Willard. Uh, it should be obvious to everyone why I am so proud of FIU law graduates. Uh, you, are, you are fantastic. I think it's also obvious that there is a lot of work to do and we really must put words into action. Uh, I'd also just like to thank Jasmine Grant and also Professors Cote, Wasserman, and Anglad for all of their assistance in this series. Uh, finally, I would like to recommend the movie, Just Mercy. This is about the wrongful capital conviction of Johnny D, and it's available for streaming until the end of the month on virtually every platform. Uh, we will also be running a panel on July 22nd at 5.30 that will discuss both the film 
and more generally issues of race in the criminal justice system. And you'll hear more from us on that. So with that, thank you once again to everyone for being here. And of course, to our panelists and our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.